Hi, my name is Kia. I'm a health and fitness coach, and today I'll be talking with Denise Washington. Denise has always been an active person, but life got busy with kids, work, and everything else. And life got even busier when she started caring for her husband. Now, during this time, Denise realized that she gained over 100 pounds, and she didn't feel like herself anymore. But at 55, Denise decided it was time for a change. She set out to get healthier and ended up completely changing her life. Now in her 60s and 100 pounds lighter, Denise is a real example that it's never too late to turn things around. Now as somebody who's been through the ups and downs of weight loss, as you guys have seen on my channel, I have learned that it's all about balance and creating sustainable habits. That's why it's my goal to empower as many women as I can on my channel and in my 12 week program to show that true wellness does not have to be a struggle. So just like my own journey of shedding over 50 pounds, Denise's journey is a powerful example that it's never too late to make a change. And I'm so, so happy to share her inspiring story. Stay tuned. Hello everyone. I want to welcome a special guest. Her name is Denise Washington. Denise, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, please tell us, tell us all about yourself. Oh, there's so much to say. <laughs> I am at this present time, 68 years, years old. However, my goal right now is to show women that those years after 50 can be fruitful, full, and full of, full of life. I basically changed my life, changed the way I live. And each day is an, ad, an adventure, and hopefully I can spur others to do, to do the same. Okay. And, and what, um, what made you decide to, to do that? Oh, goodness. This starts back because I've always been a very active person. But when I got married, had children, all that stuff and work became prominent. So my working out, my lifting weights, that became something that I didn't, I didn't do. I became a caregiver for my spouse and I, in about 2002, but I looked up about five years after that and I had gained 100 pounds. I did not look like anyone in my family. My spouse was the one that got me on the path because he regis registered me for a program. And he did it in, what was it, 2007, but I didn't go. He came back and did it again in 2008 and he was smart. What he <laughs> did then was he gave me the check, had everything purchased and said, here, boom, here it is for three months. And that got me on the path of losing the weight, feeling better and with each pound, I wanted to challenge myself. So I started with doing five, five Ks. Okay. After I did the five K, I said, well, gee, if I can do five, five Ks in a row, I can probably do a half marathon. And I did. So I started doing the more half mar marathon. I completed that for four years and then just continued to up my fitness. Unfortunately, in 2016, my husband passed. But right before he did, he told me, he said, now you're going to have time to do all these things that you put on the side when you became a parent and a wife. And of course, the first year, I'm still grieving, but the first year, I, did, I didn't want to hear this. But after about 14 months, I said, well, you're still here. So I started doing things like I became certified as a spin instructor. I became a personal trainer. I got involved in different acts activities that I really enjoy, the more I did it, it was like almost more like more of these types of activities were being drawn to me. This is where I am now. And I don't think I'm extra extraordinary. I think that all women, because I have a business where I motivate women to get themselves back and working out and then seeing what else could you do with your life? But in their 50s, women that are paying attention, I'm seeing it more with women in their late 40s because they're really smart. And I know I felt this. It was almost a tap on my shoulder that was like mother. And I really feel it's mother nature telling, telling me, I am not playing, playing around. You <laughs> have to find your purpose. 
You have to get healthy. You have to do other things other than just serving your family because they're out doing their thing. And you have a choice. You can listen to it. It's going to get louder or you can ignore it. And in interviewing women to see whether or not we're a good fit for my program that I do with them, the ones that ignore it, regret it. And I'm seeing so many women that when I talk about that tap, they shake their head and go, oh yeah, I know exactly what you're, you're talking about. And it's my joy when they can turn that tap into something they never thought they had. So this is where I am now. Okay. And it's good for women who, um, who recognize that to be able to, um, to share that with, with you, with someone who has had that previous experience as well. Yes. How do you feel that that helps you um, uh, guide women? Because I think walking in there, they might look at me and say, oh, she's always been this way her whole life. And when I tell them the ups and downs of my life, yeah, I was fit when I was 30. I also didn't have children. I wasn't married. <laughs> so I had all this time to work out. But for them to understand that not only has there been ups and downs in my life, but it's not linear. I had to go here and then come back and then regroup and then come back, that they can do this also, that they can remake their lives. And even if it doesn't go the way they want it to go, and this is going to sound so cliche, that journey, it is the journey to get to wherever it is that I wanted to. That's what's been so exciting for me. And I think that people can relate to that. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, it's, it's, um, it's something that I focus on as well. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that you have that opportunity to share your experiences. Um, one experience that I'm really interested in learning more about is one that you just had in July. Tell us a little bit about it. I hiked the Logan Gover, which I probably am mispronouncing it, <laughs> trail in Southern Iceland. I was out there for six days with 16 women, 15 who were strangers to me because a friend came with me. Usually I don't ask friends to come on my adventures, but I did this one time and I'm really glad I did to share this with another, another person. We hiked hut to hut. Meaning every day we packed our stuff, whatever we needed for the hike, and we got out there. Things like your sleeping bag and your other clothes, those were shuttled on a van. But our guide was 24 years old. She was native to the country. We were the first group that she did that had excellent weather. So what she did was rather than they had said that we were gonna hike seven to eight miles per day. Since it was so beautiful, she would extend each day because she wanted to show us different places. And by then we were like, yay, we wanna go. Now she was 24, the average age was 59. We had women there from 30, I know that was so extraordinary. 30 to the oldest person was 71, which I was amazed. Yeah. The hike itself is beautiful. The hike itself was challenging and I trained. This hike was challenging. You did not finish the day and go, oh, well, I feel fine. <laughs> no, you finished the day and you were tired. Not only were you tired, we still had to make dinner <laughs> when, we got, when we got to the hut. It wasn't like dinner was waiting for us. No, we had to now come together as a group, make dinner. And I think all of this, the pain, the communal and, oh, did I mention we had 23 hours of sunlight? Oh, wow. The sun never really set wow. because I have pictures at 3 a.m. that look like six o'clock here, but there was no problem sleeping because number one, everybody had masks, eye masks on to sleep. And number two, you were so tired. <laughs> By 10, we're out. 9.30, we're done, <laughs> we're finished. I learned so much about me 
because not to build myself up, but I was sick. The second day I woke up with the fever and they asked me, do you want to do this hike? And I said, just let me sit out here in the sun for a while. And I said, there's no way in heck that I am going to ride with my luggage. I said, no, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And I was able to push through it. I was not, I had help from other people. People gave me, eh, what is it, echinacea eh, mm -hmm. and other herbs so that I could make it through. But I will never forget that time on that trail. The beauty of it, there were times that I had to actually talk to the uni universe and say, the universe would not put me in this if I could not do it. Because there were many a days that we were on a ledge on the side of the mountain. One side was a canyon and the other side was nothing. And my thought was, I wouldn't be here if I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And I would actually have to tap into that and breathe through it and go, okay, you're fine. Nobody's falling off the cliff. Everybody's fine. We had water crossings, which I practice water crossings here in Jersey, but that was going through water up to my ankle. Wow. I went to Iceland and this was a raging river up to my knees. <laughs> totally different experience. But again, the guide, she'd been doing this. She was 24. She's been hiking this trail since she was 14. And all it was, you have to trust her because she would talk everyone through it. And we did like two water crossings a day. By day four, it was no problem. We just went through it. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Yes. So I have a couple of questions. Sure. Well, a few questions actually. So I'm I'm going to ask a, a bunch of them now, and then um, you can continue on. So I have a question um, about how far did you go each day? Um, how long were your days um, in terms of hiking? And okay. um, uh, give us um, give us a description of what your day was like from the time you woke one. Give us a day. Um, from the time you woke up until okay. the time it was supposed you you went to bed. We were supposed to do, as I said, like seven to eight miles per day. Mm -hmm. We ended up doing an average of 15 miles each day. Wow. Each day, the terrain was different. For example, first day we got there, poor little innocent fools, because I look at the pictures and say, we look like innocent fools. We didn't know what we had signed up for. And we're taking pictures. Beautiful. The day started out beautiful. We hiked for about six hours, four hours, two hours in, torrential rains. Then it started the winds. Then the snow. It didn't snow on us, but there was still snow on the ground. And we basically just went up and down at least 10 mountains. Every time she's like, okay, we're going up there. I'm like, up there? Yes. And we're coming down here. And she would stop and we'd talk and the rain's hitting us. And <laughs> the next day, beautiful day, up and down mountains also. But we also went through um, black sand. So we had a day that was flat. Everybody was like, yay, but you're walking through sand. So that's a little bit of a challenge. We had a day when we were in a canyon. So you think a canyon is flat. Yeah, but you still have ups, ups and downs. And they actually have forest which I thought was amazing in Iceland because she had told us that the Vikings had cut down all the trees so now they are rebuilding their forest and the forest the trees are about as tall as I am but our day would start around seven because it would be a crew each day a different crew would make breakfast and you'd have anything from oatmeal which I was not having I'm not I'm not gonna lie to you and then you had other choices of things like say various breads with um butters or maybe you'd want to have what you had for dinner because we always have leftovers we would then pack up you'd pack your stuff your gear and you'd have to make lunch which really consisted of which I know is going to sound like a lot two hearty sandwiches you you needed it you needed it because we were going to be hiking from about, we would pull out about 9 a.m. And we would come into camp at about 8. Yes. So we had hearty snacks. Everybody 
shared snacks that we were carrying, which they supplied. And plus, I know I brought my own and most people did. And we would, she would tell us what we were going to do. By the third day, we realized that whatever this guide said, add a few miles on because that's not the way it was going, going to go. We would stop maybe every two hours for a break. And then we would take a lunch, a lunch break for about 40, 45, 45 minutes, because you didn't want to stop and stay still too often because you had older people. We get still. <laughs> so people <laughs> wanted to keep to keep keep going. We would rarely meet and which I thought was odd, other hiking groups on the trail. Okay. It was one group that we kept meeting and I don't understand how this worked, but they were always going in the opposite direction. And my thought, if I, if I missed, if I hit you once going in the opposite direction, I shouldn't see you again, but we would see them often. And then we would go to the huts. Now, the huts, the, I'm going to tell you that first night, that hut, I said out loud, I'm leaving. Now, there's no way I could have left because somehow or another, my brain forgot this. When we left Reykjavik, which is the capital, not only was it a four-hour ride to the trailhead, that ride encompassed, <laughs> I was so silly, crossings, river crossings. That the bus had to go through and the bus is going side to side. And you could actually see the water seeping into the bottom of the bus. That's how much. So I wasn't going anywhere, but I was determined. I said, I'm, I'm not staying, staying here because we were in a very small room. I mean, now I could do a hut, but it had bunk beds. Whoever slept on the bottom bunk had to share a bunk with someone you, that you just met. And you had your own sleeping bag. And, oh, there were other hikers there. So there were other hiking groups, although we had rented, you know, 16 beds in for us. There were other hikers there. Okay. These other hikers didn't realize that there were six. They knew 16 people were coming, but they didn't save us 16 places together. So some of our group was upstairs, some was downstairs. I ended up being in a top bunk. I have never been in a top bunk in my life. <laughs> out of these six nights, no, six it was six days, five nights. Out of the five nights, four, I was in a top bunk. Okay. By the fourth night, I could hop up in the top bunk because some had some had railings and stairs to go up. Others had nothing. One was so tight to the top of our hut. I got up the next morning, hit my head. Somebody said, are you okay? I'm like, no, I'm not. But they varied. And not all huts had showers. Okay. So that was an interesting experience. But after we would hike, we'd have to come home. Well, I oh gee, I'm referring to a hut as home. That's interesting. And we would make dinner and a different group would make dinner. And the thing with dinner is that we ended up in a communal hall, the same hall that we would use for breakfast, but dinner is where we interacted with other groups. So we met people from other countries. Some of the people that were in there weren't staying in the hut, but they were actually camping outside oh. in tents. I'm not ready for the tent experience yet. I, I'm still, I'm good with huts. Yes. What was the weather like again? It was beautiful. It was between, somebody told me that one morning it was 32 degrees. It didn't feel like it, but it was, um, the, the highest was 50 degrees, but it was very windy. Mm. So in most of my pictures, I have like either a hat on or my hood on or a windbreaker because it was just that windy that you needed it. And I always had on gloves. I did, I always had on gloves because it, it was, it was, it was chilly and, but the weather was beautiful. The pictures, although my pictures came out beautiful, they don't capture it because it was like, oh, wow. And it almost looks like, now that I look at my pictures, like, well, that mountain looks like that mountain looks like this mountain, but it wasn't, there was just so much there. Wow. Yeah. 
So your overall impression of your experience there. I'm going to carry this with me for the rest of my life. And I am still learning things about myself that became evident during the hike. I'm stronger than I thought. I have a very spiritual presence that I do lean on that I didn't realize I did, that I lean on in times of stress. And not only do I have that presence, I know that it's going to come through for me. And that if I am in a situation, there is a reason why I'm there. And I'm just going to have to trust the process. And that trusting the process is a little hard for me still. Okay. How did you prepare for this? Well, I thought I prepared well. You know, <laughs> I, I prepared the best that I could. I increased my weight, weight training because I figured that I would need to have some muscle in order to do the hike. I also didn't know or I wasn't prepared for, or no, I can't say that. I didn't realize what they were going to be feeding me. So I also wanted to put a little bit more muscle on because my thought was you're going to lose muscle during the hike because you're not going to have as much protein as you needed. But that was that was not a worry. I did a lot of cardio, which meant not only was I teaching spin, but I was teaching a lot of high intensity. I know my my members really understood it because I told them why why we were doing doing this. Mm -hmm. I did a lot more walking. I incorporated running and walking into what I was doing. I did some rowing also, indoor rowing. And I did a lot of strenuous hikes. So any hike that I saw that had ele elevations of say 2000 feet, 1000 feet, I was like, okay, I want to be there or anything that was over a lot of rocks. Because just recently I went back to one of what I considered one of the most challenging hikes that I'd ever gone on. Because when I got to the bottom, the base of this boulder that I had to go up and I saw everybody go, I'm like, how do I get up there? And I mean, I made it. Mm -hmm. But when I went back this time, it wasn't as big a challenge. It didn't look as steep. It didn't feel as hard. And I, I had to pat myself on the back. I said, job well done. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's how I pra practiced and made sure that I had the proper gear. I'm a gearhead, which meant that if two pairs of hiking boots worked, then what the heck, we need to buy three. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask this because I know that there are a lot of women out there watching uh, this video who are mm -hmm. like, wow, you know, I would love to do that, but I'm just too old. Um, I'm too out of shape. I'll never be able to, to get there. What, what do you have to say to them? I tell people that you have to meet yourself where you are. I was 100 pounds heavier than I am right now a good 15 years ago. I did not lose that 100 pounds overnight. Each day I worked at it. I started exactly where I was. Somebody who I had worked out in the past, hadn't done it in about say maybe 20 years with any consistency. So you start out with something that you can do. I'm not saying hop on a spin bike, but walk, everybody can walk everybody can walk so you can start there raise your heart rate increase your distance then start adding weights do you start with 35 pounds of course not you're going to start with five and then five becomes easy and then you up it to maybe seven that's what you do these are small changes in the meantime let's say that you do need to lose weight once you start working out what you eat will automatically change. Because if you're continuing to put junk in, your body's not gonna have the fuel and you're gonna want to feel better. You're gonna wanna continue to have that good feeling from working out after you eat and knowing that you're supporting it. 
And all these things slowly come together. And I think what people fail to realize is it's a process. It takes a long time. I've, I'm still working on me. I am still working on me because do I eat so-called clean 100% of the time? No, I am an 80-20 person. I am 80%, I am good, 20%. I'm looking for the Reese's peanut butter cups to shove in my face. <laughs> yes, and I think um, I'm the same way. And um, I will remain that way because you know what? Yes. I enjoy that 20%. And so I'm not going to eliminate it from my life. Um, but, you know, good habits for the long term that will sustain you for a lifetime is is what mm -hmm. you, what your, what the goal should be. And, exactly. Um, yeah. I, I really enjoyed speaking with you, Denise. I really want to bring you back. Uh, Thank you. But in the meantime, tell us how um, uh, our viewers can find you. I'm on Instagram, dwspinner55. Yes, I got that after I started um, taking spin. I'm also on YouTube, Denise E. Washington. Okay. And I will put a link in the description box um, so that uh, they can find you uh, there as well. Um, again, thank you so much uh, for, for coming on here and sharing your story. Um, I, I've been to your channel. You have many, many stories. I really encourage others to, to go and visit. Um, and again, I really would like to, to bring you back and, and have you on another time. Um, so thank you, Denise. And um, I hope everybody has a great day. And I want to thank you too. It has been my pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.